one of the things that we do that can be uncomfortable is even challenging what we have learned already. Um, for example, uh, in baseball, um, I know enough about baseball to coach uh, T-ball in Little League, right? And that was it. Like, I played as far as Little League. That, that was it. I, I like watching baseball as far as I know. And I would watch, you know, I coached Kyle as a, as a T-baller because his first year playing, I could not handle the chaos that was on the field. It, it was blasphemy. It was, right? Like, that was horrible. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You're like, no, no, that, no, that's not, no, right? So I decided I'm going to take over, take control of this situation. And I would hear many coaches say, hey, you know, if you want your kids to hit um, quicker, have them do this or have them practice doing this. And they would give me a technique like this will help your kid hit the ball faster so they'll hit balls. I said, yeah, it will. But the problem with that is it's going to develop a really bad habit for them that's going to bite them later. Because basically what you teach a kid when you're in t-ball or in, in lower ends of Little League is you teach them to hit the ball high and hard. But anybody who knows that you play baseball at about high school, if you hit the ball high and hard, what happens? You're out 90% of the time. You're basically a useless baseball player. So we teach bad habits that have to be corrected later. And I remember when, we were, when I was finally teaching Little League, fortunately, the high school coach, the baseball coach, actually worked with the Little League team coaches and say, look, we're a small town in Los Alamos, and the kids you have there, they're going to come to me, and I have to unteach some bad habits. So let me have a clinic to teach coaches what we're doing over here, so we're all on the same page. He was brilliant. I love that he did that. He would, the, the, base, the high school baseball coach at no time would invite the coaches of all the Little League teams to come and teach some basic skills so that we're not teaching bad habits. Does that make sense? So we have to undo those things and unlearn those things, and we have to do that in the church as well. And we don't like that because this is the way, you know, my coach whatever taught me. This is the way so-and-so taught me. But it might be a wrong way. And we have to concede that even though it was with good intentions, that wrong way caps us off and limits us really quickly and even gets us to the point where we can no longer survive in this game. And the same is true about our faith in Christ. The same is true about our walk with Jesus, our growth with him. So we're going to be in, in Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive its approval. For it is God's good, and you will receive its approval. Wait. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay all that is due to them. Taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. The, the dilemma that I see, you know, as a pastor, kind of seeing what's happening in the world and trying to experience it from, a, I don't know, from maybe a different perspective, from an outside perspective, is that, that we, most Christians and non-Christian people alike, so I mean we as people, the dilemma that we face is that we really like simple and direct answers today. I want the quick, short answer for everything. Which way do I turn? go west. Uh-uh. West requires me to think right or left, right? We like the simplicity of an answer. We want quickness, directedness. Is this right? Is it wrong? Right. Is this answer right? Is it wrong? So we like quickness. We like directedness. We don't want to have to put a lot of thought into it because we need to move on to the next thing. We are a very hurried society. All of us are. We have only a certain amount of time. We recognize that. And there's all kinds of things to fill that time with. And so we want to hurry up and get back to the things that we think are important or the things that we have our minds fixed on without spending too much time in the other things that seem like non-essentials. Is that fair? So we don't want to have our time wasted with critical thought and dialogue. And I know that's a generalization. But I think it's a very honest generalization. That overall, humans today, people today, do not want to have our time wasted with any critical thought or dialogue. I don't have time for this. I learned a phrase, and I'm probably going to get it wrong from, from the new generation. Just put the fries in the bag. Right? Okay, just get over with. Aiden's looking at me like, you did not. I did, bro. I did. 
Did I use it right? Yeah, I did. It's all right. Aiden's giving me the nod. I'm cool. I'm pretty much like the hippest guy. Okay, I don't have time for this. Just get to the point, right? We've all been there. Just, just give me the answer. Stop, stop with the long story. Let's get right to the ending. We as a people overall, we like the idea kind of, of Occam's razor, right? That the simplest possibility is probably reality. The easiest way, the easiest way for you to answer is that's the best one, that's the easiest one, and that'll suffice. But the problem is that we use this principle, Occam's razor. Has everybody heard what Occam's razor is? Occam's razor is kind of um, this guy, Occam, just said, you know, in the scientific world that the, the, the simplest answer that requires the least amount of variables is probably the best answer, right? And so it's called a razor because it's meant to cut off all those things that just kind of distract us from it. Like, let's, cut, let's just get to the meat of this, right? Let's cut off all the other nonsense. Let's get to the meat. And that's fair. That makes sense. But the problem is that we don't use this principle anymore to just cut out unnecessary variables. We actually use this razor to cut out anything and everything that we personally don't already know or understand. That is not in what I already know, what I believe. Get it out of here. It has no place in this conversation. That is not already what I know, what I believe. Cut it out. Get it out of this conversation. You're wasting my time with this thought or this idea that's outside of what I already believe. Right? Uh, Dan, Dan always likes to talk about the, the algorithm. And he's not wrong, right? That we recognize, I hope you recognize it, your computers, your internet, Facebook, everything is built on an algorithm that's meant to put you closer and closer in an echo chamber so that all you hear is what you want to hear all the time and nothing else about reality. If you think that unicorns are going to save the world, it's going to find you every single thing in the world to show you and to prove to you and convince you that unicorns are going to save the world because they have magical powers. I don't know how they think, right? We'll believe that. So this is where we've become as a society. We're becoming more and more self-aggrandized, more and more self-reliant, more and more I already know the answer. What I need is to find a people who know the same things I already know. And I don't need any, any people outside of what I know to challenge me. In fact, we'll call those toxic people. And so we misuse the word toxic to anything that doesn't describe what I already believe. We have a bad habit already of using our own personal knowledge, logic, and experience to be the standard by which we decide what is important and what should be chopped away. Every person who's had a conversation with another person knows that we do this. And, and as a pastor, so in a Christian context, one of the examples is a phrase that makes me cringe every time I hear it. Now, now before I say it, I want to say, I, I, what the phrase says is true if it's considered properly. But the phrase in and of itself, the way it is used and the way it is said, actually makes me cringe. I'll explain in a second. Here, here it is. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. How many times have we heard that? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And that's all we do. We're done. I don't need to argue with you because God said it. I believe it. That settles it. So let me begin with yes. I believe everything that God says. I do. If God says it, it is true. In fact, it is so true that when God said, let there be light, there was no light. Light hadn't been invented yet. It did not exist. This thing that didn't even exist, this concept that wasn't even there, leapt into existence just to obey God's word because he's that truthful. He says something and it is true because he said it. Which is a weird concept that we can't get. That'd be a whole other conversation. So I trust what God says is true. But I cringe when I hear the statement because when most people say it, and usually this is unintentionally, they don't actually consider what God is saying. They're only considering what it is that they're hearing. So, so if they're honest, what they mean is, what I think God said is it, and I believe it, and that settles it. That's really what they mean by that statement. They trust that their hearing, what I heard, what I believe that says, is as inerrant as God's word himself. And think about that. Because what that does, that puts me in an equal pedestal with God. God said it. I am the perfect person of understanding. I understand it perfectly. And that settles it. I am equal with God. All the rest of you are peons, but it's okay. One day you may be as great as I am. Oh, you're welcome. That's been my theme song all week. You're welcome. It's annoyed the kids. Sorry. Hi. This is how I understand it, so it must be precisely what God is saying. And without meaning to do so, that statement most often means 
I, more than any other person or group of people, am the ultimate authority in the interpretation of Scripture, and I am the only person in the history of Christianity who's got it right. Now, we wouldn't say it that way because that just sounds ridiculous. But the truth is, that is what we mean. That's what's inside of that statement, the way it is so often said. And, and as a pastor, I'm going to tell you something. Those types of people are the most difficult to minister. Trying to share the gospel with an unbeliever is not that bad. Sharing the gospel message with Christ, having a conversation with an atheist or a Buddhist or a Muslim for a pastor, that, 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 you know, that is what it is. But the most difficult, the most frustrating, the most, the most unproductive conversations that I have as a pastor concerning the gospel message are with churched people who already know everything and don't need to be taught anything else. And it's frustrating because those people are the ones giving witness in the world. I already got this. You say I'm wrong. Everybody else says I'm wrong. But I know I'm right. So I'm going to go out there and tell them I'm right in the name of Jesus. And so in the name of Jesus, I'm going to tell them I am the ultimate authority. I am the one that is Jesus. And we give this false testimony of Christ. And it causes all kinds of problems that we can imagine. And also as a pastor, I have countless people bringing very valid and very important questions about Christianity. About, about Christianity, about the church, about the Bible, about theology. And I love that. I do. Please never stop doing that. Your questions matter. They are valid. They are important. But because they are valid and they are important, like most things in this world that are real and valid and important, the question and the answer are also usually complicated. Right? There, there's a history, there's something to be unpacked behind the question. And there's always something to be unpacked and taught and set up, a foundation set up into the answer. But rarely will the inquirers allow for any response that addresses the complexity of the question. I have only a few times, out of all the questions that I've had, only a few times are people willing to actually hear an answer. Most often, they want an affirmation. I just need to know that this is yes or no. Go, don't go. Buy or sell. Just tell me what to do. And they don't want us to unpack this. And, and, and it saddens me and it frustrates me because what it does is it leads to a very shallow theology. We, we, have, we have a nation full of Christians who are a mile wide, right? They're about an inch deep. And honestly, I think that was, that was in the 90s, they were an inch deep, Janet, when you were a kid. Now they're half inch, maybe a quarter inch if we're lucky. Because look, we have now changed the order of knowledge. You have the person who studied, experienced it, the college level, the master's degree, the doctor's degree, and the guy who watched the YouTube video. Right? We have changed the order of, of knowledge and education. And we do this with Christ and with Jesus and then with the scriptures as well. And what happens is this leads to harming others in the name of God. This misuse of Scripture is, is, is what we use to, to justify horrific acts in this world, none of which did the Scripture actually say we could do. The oppression of women, the oppression of people of color, all of these things that we did in the name of Jesus. But Jesus said, don't do that. It leads to a shallow faith that is also shattered when we encounter the traumas of life. The reason we see a decline in churches today, especially after COVID, was quite simply because we have spent the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years developing disciples that were about that thick and so fragile and weak in this direction. Super strong in this direction because we're wide, very fragile in this direction. And when that thing, that trauma, that COVID happened, that glass shattered. And our faith was lost. We questioned Christ, the need for the church, and walked away. Because we failed to make Christians who are critical thinkers, deep theological thinkers of the Scripture. We just wanted people to say, just believe it, have faith, don't question it. May I say, those are not what the Bible teaches us to do. So I want us to consider even that Jesus himself basically refused to give anyone a simple and a straight answer. 
I mean, have you ever been frustrated because you're like, you read Jesus, someone says, hey, Jesus, so what should we do about this? And Jesus doesn't say, hey, turn right or turn left or let's go straight or let's do that or yes, no. What, do you, what does he do? He says, ah, oh, so let me give you the parable. And he's like, ah, oh, come on. This guy, I hate asking him a question. I just want to know where the bathroom is. And he starts telling me all this stuff, right? Jesus gives complex answers to every single question. And he does this on purpose. In fact, in Mark 4, it tells us a little bit about it. It says, when Jesus was alone, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked him about the parable. So Jesus is out there telling parables. You know what a parable is? It's a story that says, let me help you understand this from a different perspective. This is the question. This is the issue. This is where you're at. I want to take you out of that perspective. It's uncomfortable. I'm going to move you over here so you see it from a completely different perspective and maybe understand it differently and more, more, with more dimensions, more deeply, more profoundly. And people don't like that. They say, why do you keep doing this in parables? And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may turn again, so they may not turn again and be forgiven. In other words, what Jesus is saying, because I can't give them the straight answer because they're not really there. It's a cheat. We can't hack our ways into salvation. We can't hack our ways into disciples. We can't cheat to get our ways there. You need to do the work. And you need to do it continuously. You need to recognize people that everything in this world is complex. That it's not black and white. We do not live in a black and white world at all. Yes, there is good. There is the white. Yes, there is evil. There is the black. The problem is we all live where these two things are meshed together. And so every person on this planet is muddling through the gray. That's reality. And that's what Jesus is saying. Real life is complicated. And one might ask, well, isn't the scriptures clear? I hear this all the time, but the scriptures are clear. No, they're not. Oh my goodness, no, they're not. Every time someone says, I'm like, are we reading the same book? Because I read through this thing a lot, and every time I read it, I, I feel like I'm a little more lost. Anybody else feel that way? Maybe it's just because I'm getting old. If the scriptures were clear, then first off, we wouldn't need it to study it. You'd read it once and you're done. It's obvious what it says. You wouldn't even need to listen to the Holy Spirit or listen to church leaders or to engage in any kind of meditation upon the Word because it was so clear. The reality is the reason we have to reread it, the reason we have to pray about it, the reason we have to seek guidance from the Holy Spirit, the reason God calls us to learn together, to speak together, to listen to the authorities within the church, the reason God calls to all these things, because God's saying, this is complex. It is not clear. You need to wrestle through it. You need to build those muscles. You need to be profoundly strong at your core. And these are the exercises everyone hates. I, I would dare say that, that studying scripture is like leg day. Nobody wants to do it. But it needs to be done. I confess, I skip leg day every time. I skip arm day also and ab day, chest day, back day, cardio day. I never skip rest day though. Bravo, right? I'm, I'm learning. Okay. <laughs> Listening to God through the Holy Scriptures requires deep thought and study. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. The, the Bible was full of priests and Pharisees who lived by the very mantra God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And their refusal to consider the complexity of reality drove them to use the word of God as a weapon to murder God himself. So that sink in. Because it's the beast of this world, the devil, that deceives us into applying the word of God in such shallow ways. And that's why in the psalm, the first psalm, the very first two verses of the psalms, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit at the seat of scoffers, but their light is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate. They meditate day and night. They consider it, they ponder it, they speak about it. The psalmist and Jesus both encourage us to consider the complexity of the Holy Scriptures as well as the complexity of life. Friends, we all want to properly divide the Word of God, right? But that requires critical thinking, and understanding. It requires an investment of our time and our energy to do so. Let me give you an example. For example, we have to recognize that the Bible is not written to you. It wasn't. Nothing in this book was written to any of you. Paul did not sit down one day and say, well, man, let's see. Kyle. Oh, Kyle. Kyle. I don't even know where to start. Dear Kyle, 
right? And then, you, yeah, right, we know it's not to us. Paul was not writing to the people in the United States at all. So let's start there. Do you hear that? Do you understand that? Paul was not writing to the people of the United States. Jesus did not speak to the people of the United States. Not one word in this book is written to the people of the United States. And you think about how easy it is for us to assume that we are the very center of everything that God has said in here. Oh, America! Because that is not what is happening. Paul was not writing to them. He was writing to churches in Rome. To a church in Rome 2,000 years ago. To real-life people in Rome who are practicing their faith in the middle of a very particular socio-political context that is not at all the context we live in today. They have their own set of real-life problems. And while the context may have some similarities to our context today, it is not the same, and it is irresponsible, even dangerous, to attempt to apply it directly and literally into our world. And as such, it's a good idea to consider what the Scriptures are trying to convey to us today in light of the real world in which they lived. Okay, if it's not written to me, I can recognize that the message is for me. That the principles are for me. So by understanding that context, I can pull out the principle and then apply it into my context properly. But that requires study and time and understanding. It's also important to read the scripture in the context of the book in which it exists. How many times do we pit one book or one phrase against another and jump around and use them as we want to use them? In this case, this is the letter to the Romans. Paul is writing to a particular church group in a particular city at a particular time who are facing a very particular and unusual circumstance, very different from any other of the churches. And this letter, that that it seeks to unite the two different people groups under one church, the Jews and the Gentiles who are both believers of Christ. How do we unite these two people groups with different cultures, with different backgrounds, into one church? That's the primary purpose of this letter. And Paul states, even the, the thesis kind of of this letter, he says, in Romans 1, 15 through 17, he says, Paul's eagerness, his eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written. The one who is righteous will live by faith. That means that everything and anything that we read in this letter must be, at the very least, viewed through this lens right here. That this is about bringing two groups together to share the gospel and to understand how to become one voice, one people. Because the letter itself also shifts the context of this passage that we've read. The immediate context of what we read here in 13, 1 through 7, just before that, we studied last week, is 12, 12, 1 all the way to 13. And right after that is is 7 to 14. Like, there's stuff before and after that. We're aware of that, right? And the stuff before and the stuff after it are so important to understanding what this passage is saying. Because Paul has said, let me write you a letter about this and this and this, and then stop you know what, let's change subject completely, full turn, we're going to talk about the government. now. That's not what he's doing at all. Nobody writes that way, and Paul certainly doesn't write that way. He writes with the profound message, a single concept, all the way through the scriptures. We talked about Romans 12, 1 through 21 over the last few weeks, and what's happening there. Paul's admonishing the church to think differently. Be transformed by the renewing of our minds into a mind that's much less like the principalities of the world and more like the cruciform Christ. The one who loves others in such a way that his desire is for their welfare. Paul's calling Christians to live, here here in chapter 12, Paul's calling Christians to live as a subversive community that challenges the established socio-political powers for the sake of change. That's a mouthful, isn't it? I should have put a slide. I didn't put a slide. 
Okay? This is what it is. He wants us to live as a subversive community. In other words, a community that is intentionally not like what we're told to be, that challenges the established powers of this world, that challenges everything about what this world says. The world says this is how politics should look. The world says this is how culture should look. The world says this is how society should look, how ethics should look, how morality should look. And we instead, we will become a people who will put that off, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're going to think differently. We're going to become subversive. We are not going to do that. We're going to stand against that. And we are going to become what God calls us to be. And not in secret, not in quiet, minding our own business. We'll just do it quietly, not affect anyone. We are going to do it real big with a big giant flag that says, we're different than you, but you're welcome to join us because this is a better way. This is what God calls us to live. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to live the way God calls to live. I'm not ashamed of the good news that God is bringing his kingdom here right now and he's doing amazing things and he calls us to be a part of it. I'm not ashamed that Jesus died on the cross. I'm not ashamed that he calls us to live this way and he's going to come back one day and he's going to restore things. I am not ashamed of those things, but so many times, even as Christians, we're like, I'm not ashamed. Hey, what's up? It just occurred to me like, how many times people come to church on a Sunday when we show up, walk in, get dressed, get ready as the bride of Christ to come see our groom, do the thing, eh, there, I'm not a clapper. We get done, walk out, and here's what we do without thinking. We walk out, take off our wedding ring, put it in our pocket so nobody sees it. We don't need the world to know we're married to Jesus. Don't need to be shoving that down their throats. We need to be subversive. We need to be different. We need to be visibly different. And next week, we're going to talk about chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, where Paul admonishes the believers to fulfill obedience and faithfulness to God through our intentional acts of loving and living for others. But do you see what both ends of this say? Love and live for others by being different, by being like Jesus. Love and live differently for others. Love and live like Jesus for the sake of others. Be different from this world. And in the middle of this, he's not changing the subject and going back. He's following these two themes. And he's saying, here's an example of how to do that. Finally, it's important to apply the whole letter in the context of the biblical message as a whole. We have to ask ourselves, how does this line up with the message that God is conveying to us through the entire canon of the Bible? Because the Bible isn't where God says this, then he changes his mind, now we're going to go this direction. Now, you know what, let's try this and let's try that. But oftentimes we treat it that way. This part was for that, this part's for that, this part's for that. And we don't see, because we are trained by this world, we're indoctrinated by this world to see things a certain way, we don't see that God has never left his path, that it's always been about this, this loving, relentless, gracious pursuit of his people to bring everybody back to him, to bring all of creation back into its instend, intended state of glory and love and peace, true shalom peace. That has never changed on any page, any word, any iota of the Bible. That message continues. So we have to ask ourselves, how is it that this thing I'm reading, how does it line up with the message that God is conveying through to us through the entire canon of the Bible? I mean, for example, the passage I read here, verses 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority, resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. It is so easy to read that and say, well, it's clear. Do what the government says. God put them there. God is controlling. God controls them. They're God's instrument. And if you don't do what they say, God will punish you. It is so clear that I am I'm baffled at how many times I have heard Christians, how many Christians I have heard state that very thing. I am blown away at how many major political people I have seen on TV state to the entire nation this passage actually use this passage and say look you may not agree with what we're doing but i'll remind you what the bible says in romans 13 that every person is subject to the governing authorities what we're doing is obviously what god wants to do so you need to get on our side or realize that you're actually against god and i'm blown away at how many christians say yes that is so true you may not like it but god says you have to obey it and follow it but the problem is that that interpretation, that use of that passage, contradicts the primary message of the Bible. 
I mean, if you're going to use that passage that way, you really do have to chunk out almost everything else of the Bible, including the rest of the letter. Either Paul didn't write it, someone stuck it in there, and it's from the devil, which means this thing's tainted. Or Paul's a liar, and he's going against God, which means this thing's tainted. But here's the reality. It's not what it says. It's not what it's teaching us to do at all. Consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. Here they are under a governing power. They're in exile. I told you guys before, the best way to understand our situation today is a people in exile. Right? We, we, we know where we need to be. We know that God's coming. He's going to rescue us. But right now, we're in Babylon. And we're told that while we're here to pray for Babylon, to live for this nation, to do the things it needs, to be a part of making this country better. That's what we need to do. We need to do our part to make this country better. Absolutely. But we need to recognize that this is where we're at, that this is exile right now. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're in exile, did not say, hey, whatever you say to do, we're on it. You want us to eat that? Let us eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Right? They didn't do that. They started eating vegetables and water. Because they refused to participate in that. They found a way to be subversive. And then when they had to do it outright, he says, look, I made this giant statue. Everybody is going to bow down and worship this statue whenever we, re- whenever we sound that horn because everyone is going to do this. That is part of what the government says. It's the law. I'm the king. Obviously, God put me here. And you can read that throughout many of the prophets and everybody else, that God put Nebuchadnezzar in that position, that God put Babylon in that position, that God used them for this time. So if God used them and God said for them to do that, then we obviously must obey them. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are disobeying God by not bowing down to that statue of another God. And they say, oh, no, negatory. Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue you have set up. Daniel 3.18. We're not going to do that. They refuse to be obedient to the governing authorities when obedience would mean disobeying God. They lived under and they submitted to the government, but they clearly also lived as a subversive community that challenged the established authority for the sake of change. In Acts 5, Peter and John are arrested by the governing authorities. Not just once, but twice. They're they're repeat offenders. Oh, my goodness. Repeat offenders. Tisk, tisk. In Acts 5, 27, after they they got arrested the second time, they they brought them to the council, uh, to the governing authorities. It says, when they brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them. The high priest, not just the government, the main guy of their religious government there, so to speak, says, hey, we gave you strict orders. We were clear. Do not teach in his name. Yet here you fill Jerusalem with your teachings and you're determined to bring this man's blood on us. We were clear. You're doing that. Stop it. The governing authority said stop it. And we all know that God is in control. God put the governing authority there. God said to obey them. So when we say do that, you need to stop it. Stop using the name of Jesus. Stop telling people about it. Quit saying his name. And how do Peter and John respond? But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than human authority. They were openly living as a subversive community that challenged the established socio-political powers sake change revelation 13 i won't read it it reminds us explicitly and vividly that civil authorities can become blasphemous enemies of god not servants of god that the bride of christ the church that's us we are to live as a subversive community that challenges the established socio-political powers for the sake of change right i'm gonna say that a lot The biblical tradition clearly indicates that God's people cannot follow the dictates of established authorities, religious or civil, should they require something opposed to God's will. Accordingly, when a civil authority is no longer a servant for God's goodwill for the world, when it engages in evil, disapproval will be, and disobedience may be necessary for Christian individuals and churches. Because we are to be the subversive community that challenges the socio-political powers for the sake of change. 
So let's put the letter in, in, in context. Romans 13, 7 says, Pay to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue is due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. So when Paul writes this, remember he's writing this to a particular group with a particular issue. They're in Rome. They're basically in the capital city. Government is all up in their face all the time. Can you imagine living in Washington, D.C.? All you would see is politics everywhere you go. This is where they live. So they live in this political center of, of the empire, of this thing that stands against everything God is about, but thinks that it is a God of itself and even God ordained. And they're facing this every day and they're saying, you know what, we're just going to, we're done. Let's just fight them. Let's go exactly against them in every single step and turn that we can. Let's fight everything that they do. And Paul's like, stop. Remember, be at peace as much as possible with you. Love each other. Don't attack evil for evil, but rather overcome evil with good. We need to change our strategy, a way of doing things. It's not about all policies or laws. It's about the act of paying taxes. That's all this passage is about. It's about them paying taxes. He's saying, you guys are fighting. They're saying, we're so against government, we're going to stop paying our taxes. Now, you stop paying your taxes right now, what's going to happen? Y'all know. Yeah, that's what they put Al Capone away for. You got to pay your taxes. They come running at it. This is not something new. This has been happening from way back. And in Rome, if you didn't pay your taxes, it's actually worse than what the IRS will do today. They'd plumb kill you. And to be fair for what the IRS wants, maybe death is better than what they want from us, right? Like, you might as well just take everything I got. But that's all it's about. It is only about taxes. At least in this context. And previous to it, Paul says, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you'll keep burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but, be o- but overcome evil with good. When we read this today, so often we think like, well, what he's talking about here is the enemies are those who are against us as Christians. It's those who are, who are um, worldly-minded, the unbelievers, the atheists, the liberals, whatever it is, those people who want to push agendas that, that destroy the sanctity of marriage, those who want to do that. Those are the enemies. Those are not at all the enemies that Paul is talking about here at all. The enemy for these Romans, when they're saying it, is their government. It is the empire. That's their enemy. It's not about other people. They're recognizing we're believers. They're unbelievers. They have their own ideology. They have their own ideology. They have things that we don't believe in. They're exactly opposite. But they're not the enemy. That person right there, that government that, that's pitching us against each other, that's the enemy. And we forget that so many times, especially as Americans, who, who look, listen, I love the country. Best country in the world. I think best country ever. It's going to be hard to top this. It really is. But this country is not God. And I see so many Christians make this country, this nation, their God. This country isn't ordained by God in that God said, I'm going to create America to save the world. Oh my God, could we be more arrogant? He did not. God does not use nations nor kings to do his work of good. God uses the church to do that. He uses nations and kings in the scriptures as punishment. Consider that. Paul continues this theme in 13. Live in peace, show unmerited grace and love. Because the elephant in the room, the number one enemy that you face, these people, as Roman Christians, is the government. And because the government is a creation of mankind to attempt to do something that only God can do, it fails. The government tries to lead us into life. It does. That's its desire. I believe that that was the intention of America. Like, we're going to find a new way to make a place where the government, where the people come together and lead us into life. And that's a beautiful thing. It's something that still gives me hope in this country. I feel like that is still what makes us kind of special. Like, it's kind of who we were from the beginning and who we want to be. But here's the thing. The country can't do that. The government can't do that. Only God can do that. And so it's okay, it's wonderful, it's even expected for us to to serve our nation, to love our nation, to want the best for it, to be great patriots. But I would argue the way to be the best patriot for this nation is to live 
as members of the kingdom of God. And let this nation see that so that it would transfer into that. But because the government fails, we struggle. And then Paul says, look, let every person be subject to governing authorities. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, obey the authorities blindly. He says, be subject to them. Recognize that if they're going to do this, they're going to do this. And if you do that, that's going to be the response. You, you want to you participate in civil disobedience? Do so knowing the response and being willing to go through that. The gospel that Paul proclaims, therefore, requires that believers in this situation follow the relevant laws. They pay their taxes, seeking thereby to live at peace with all. And that's what we should do as people. That's the message. We need to follow the relevant law, do what's due, so that we can live at peace with all. And so we transfer, we apply this principal message into our context as U.S. Americans today. Right? That's who we are. So pay your taxes, but give your allegiance to God, not to Caesar. Right? I pay my taxes. I cringe every time. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm a pastor. And Lord, forgive me for saying this, but be gentle and graceful on me. In my head, I cuss when I pay my taxes. There are words that should not be coming up. But man, they want a lot of money. It hurts. Right? So I pay my taxes. But I give my allegiance to God. I do not give my allegiance to the government, to the nation, to Caesar. Recently, many new government leaders were elected into office. Right? Whether it be local, county, state, federal. All kinds of new leaders have been elected into office. It, it, it's, there's a huge shift also. I follow uh, Mexican politics as well. There's a huge shift. There's a new president in Mexico, right? A woman president. Love that. There's shifts all over this world. It's not just us. And it's scary. But here's what we as Christians need to remember. Government leaders do what government leaders do. All politicians are required by their job to compromise. And that's something that we struggle with. Because we never want to compromise our faith or integrity as Christians. But because that's man-made, they're required to compromise to move forward. They're required to even set aside their ethics and their morality sometimes to get a job done. But that's not what we do. We're not here to get a job done. We're here to exist in a new way, in a new light that makes a difference for the world around us. And, and here's the other thing. Listen, God's not surprised by any king, government, or authority that humanity creates. It doesn't surprise him. It, it is what we do, especially as a fallen people. We struggle, so we look for a king. Samuel, give us a king. And God says, that is a bad idea, but I'm going to let you have it. The people said, give us a king. That's a bad idea, but I'm going to let you have it. And even as Americans, regardless of where we stood, we said, give us a king. And God says, that's a bad idea, but I'm going to let you have it. And as long as we recognize that and understand that, we can better participate even for the benefit and the welfare of our nation. Who was elected makes little difference in the grand scheme of things. Because nations and kings come and go, but God is eternal. So again, who was elected makes little difference in the grand scheme of things. Although it does, it does absolutely have a real implications for today and our immediate future. And it does matter. And so we live again in this tension of the, at the end of the day, it's not about our government, it's about God. But at the end of the day, we're living in this day and tomorrow our government may come after us. They may come after my neighbor. They come, may come after whoever it is. And we know that because historically, that's what governments do. Every nation ever in the history of humanity. As Christians, we must do everything that we can do to ensure peace. Not just for us, but peace for others. Peace for the foreigner. Peace for the hungry. Peace for the imprisoned. Peace for the oppressed. Now think about this. Because that group of people that I just listed there, those are literally the people groups that God names as requirements for Christians to defend and help. If paying our taxes keeps peace, then do so. If showing respect due to an office keeps the peace, then do so. But if those entities call us to participate in sinful acts against God and creation, 
And we are to refuse and to stand against those tyrannies. We, the people of God, the church, we are to live as a subversive community that challenges the established socio-political powers for the sake of change. And we do that by intentionally living as subjects of the kingdom of God where Jesus alone is king. This last decade, at least, has been so divisive in our nation. It seems like everything anymore is driven by fear and hatred. In fact, it kind of breaks my heart because my oldest is, my oldest is 18, and I don't even think that she remembers a time when this country wasn't so full of hatred and fear. Because that's what we've become. And, and I mean everybody. We are just so full of fear and hatred that it has become this backdrop upon everything that we live and we consider it okay so long as I hate and fear on the right side. And I struggle with that. I hate that. Human lines have been drawn on all sides. If you cross this line, you're the enemy. I'm sorry, if you cross this line, you're the enemy. Intolerance for insubordination has become the mantra of both of our major political parties. It's both of them. Both of them state clearly that we, they will be intolerant for insubordination against what they believe. If you're not with us, you're against us. That is the statement that most people in America make today when it comes to politics. If you're not with us, you're against us. Here's the problem with that. Only Jesus has the right to say that. Only Jesus has the right to say, who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Only Jesus. And the instant any human being, any human created entity, any other entity or, or object or whatever it is in the entire universe, the instant that thing says, you're either with me, you're against me. That person, that group, that, that, that political party, whatever it is, that person claims to stand equal with God and make themselves gods of their own. The beast of this world, the Antichrist, will often take the words of Christ and pervert them for his own use to deceive the world. Just think about that. This passage from Paul is not at all a command to obey the government with the authority of God. It is a way for Christians to live as a subversive community that challenges the established socio-political powers for the sake of change. A Christian is free from the tyranny of obedience to political figures and entities, but we are obligated to love and to work for the common good, even when doing so is an act of disobedience because we are the body of Christ. We are the church. And we are to be a subversive community. I want to invite the team to come back up. I know at least in my lifetime it seems like now more than ever, this world, this nation needs the church to step up. It needs Christians to be Christians. To recognize that everything that we do is supposed to be as a way to participate with God in making this world look more like the kingdom of God. But to do that also with this genuine love for others. Not to punish the enemy, not to eradicate the enemy, not to destroy them and say they are the enemy, we will destroy them entirely, we will chase them out, they can go live somewhere else. But rather to look at every other person on this planet and with genuine love and sympathy and concern, live in such a way that would draw them closer to God so that they too may become a part of the community, of the kingdom of God. But that part can be difficult for us. Because it is, it is easy to hate what we're taught in works. Loving others is a sign of weakness in our world. So many of the, of the things that Jesus says, I hear others use as a way to disparage each other, to insult each other, to tear each other down. And so many times, 
So many times I see people use this as a weapon to destroy and to deceive. When Jesus says that he has come to build, to share food. So let's be a different type of people. Amen?